I worked at a restaurant where we made Roman style artichokes. Cleaning artichokes was the bane of our existence and we always had to have probably 20 pounds of cleaned ones ready for any night. It became like a team sport. We'd like do all of our work and then clean artichokes for 30 minutes before we went home. I mean, we were really happy when the restaurant closed because it, like, <laughs> it meant we never had to do another artichoke. I will tell you who was sad was our artichoke supplier. <laughs> I'm Samin Nasrat. I'm a writer, a teacher, and a cook, and the creator of Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, the show and the book. And today I'm gonna make some artichokes, some beautiful grilled artichokes, and then to serve, we're gonna have an herby vinaigrette. The very first day I ever volunteered in the kitchen at Chez Panisse, we were making artichoke ravioli. When I watched the chefs have to peel and throw away all of the leaves, I was like, this is insane, the amount of waste is so crazy. But it does look like a lot of waste until you realize the most delicious part really is the heart and the stem, which is really a continuation of the heart. So you have to get rid of all this fibrous, pokey outside stuff to get to that inside stuff. I just start by pulling them all off. So once you get to mostly yellow and purpley leaves, that's where I stop, bye bye. So the other thing about artichokes to know is that they're gonna turn brown, they're gonna oxidize, like every time there's some inner part exposed. So you have to work quickly. And then when you get to the really delicate parts, everything goes into water that has some form of acid in it, like vinegar. These are really big and quite sturdy artichokes. So it's nice to use a knife to do like the initial trimming. And because they'll like destroy a delicate Japanese knife, it's nice to use a serrated bread knife because it can sort of take it. If it's purple, it's gonna be fibrous. And so again, I'm so sorry. It seems like I'm getting rid of so much. I know it's gonna break your heart, but you really gotta go pretty much down because once I cut, you just see it gets more, more and more purple and that's more and more prickly, more and more fibrous. You don't wanna eat it. This is like one of my all time favorite kitchen tools, the little bird's beak paring knife. And that curved beaky thing is gonna be perfect for going around these curves. You have to strike a balance between getting rid of everything bitter, but keeping as much of the heart as possible. Cause this is the good stuff. This hairy stuff, that's choke. This is the chokiest artichoke I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> So we have to remove all of that. I don't know for sure, but I think it's called choke because it gets caught in your throat if you, if you eat it. It's not poisonous or anything, it's just deeply unpleasant. So I like to use a spoon and I just sort of scoop back along the bottom of the choke. See, it's a lot in there. Imagine eating that. It's like a little mini hairball stuck in the back of your throat. This <laughs> turns into this. <laughs> Since these guys are so fibrous, it would take 350 years to grill them from raw. So I'm just gonna boil them first until they're tender and then kind of coat them in olive oil and get them cooked that second time. I will tell you that's the secret to grilling most vegetables properly. To boil anything, you want it to be in a nice salty pot of water. This is actually kind of a secret, wonderful, genius way to get them seasoned all the way from within. And you do that by creating a nice salty environment for them to cook in. This is diamond crystal kosher salt, which is the least salty salt that I've ever used. It does take quite a bit to get a pot salty. In we go. Anytime I'm gonna add shallot or onion into a dressing, it's the first part I get going because I wanna macerate that allium, the shallot or the onion, so that it can, like it's raw, fiery bite can be sort of softened and cut down. So macerate is just like a fancy kitchen word for pouring acid over something. And you can let that sit for like minimum of 10 minutes, but up to, I don't know, a couple hours if you want to do it in advance. So while that sits, I'll chop up some parsley. So while these have been cooking, I've been working on the dressing, but also I don't want to just let them go <laughs> without checking them. So I'm just going to sort of pierce one with a knife and really you want to go until they're all the way tender. I'm gonna let it go for like another 45 seconds or so. One of the cool things I actually learned while I was researching my book was that anytime you boil a vegetable and you pull it out of water, it's gonna start expelling the water that it holds and drying out. So one way to stop that 
is to kind of plug up the holes that would have been expelling water with olive oil. So I just sort of usually toss vegetables that come out of the boiling water with a little bit of oil, which in this case is helpful because we're gonna end up using that oil for grilling anyway. Beautiful. So these guys mm, are nicely seasoned. They're perfectly salted throughout because the water was so heavily seasoned. So I didn't need to add more salt on top. We're not grilling to cook. We're grilling to get that grill taste or that beautiful browning. Uh, here's my shallots. We have a little honey, a little mustard. Mustard also has salt. So I'll just add a small pinch. I like black pepper in my dressings. In general, I add about three parts oil for one part acid. The only way to know what's right, honestly, is to taste it with a piece of whatever you're gonna serve it with. But I always want the zing from perfectly saltiness and then also the zing. <laughs> I wanna have a little bit of like my eyebrows go up from how acidic it is. Okay, let's check what's happening. Nothing there. Something's happening. I'm having an idea. It's kind of one that could be possibly totally risky. <laughs> Maybe you're gonna think it's a terrible idea. Maybe you're gonna think it's a wonderful idea. But it's that we could put a piece of foil over this and then put another heavy pan on top and smush our guys down so they have more contact and get more brown. But I'm not sure that it won't turn it into artichoke mush. <laughs> if I'm gonna grill something or if I'm after browning, I want as much browning, like evenly over the whole surface as possible. Okay, it's not mush, that's good. The most important lesson that I can ever teach anyone or the best way to empower people is to learn how to be present in the moment and to use your senses as you're cooking to make decisions that may take you off of the page, may take you away from the recipe. And I know that my ultimate goal is maximal browning, so I thought, okay, how can I get there? You know, using the tools that are available to me. If I want maximal browning, I want maximal artichoke in contact with the surface. And to get that, instead of standing there and individually pressing each one down, I decided to just use this heavy, heavy pan. Okay, I'm smelling burning, which probably means we're good. <gasps> Beautiful. It's perky and it's acidic. It's not too sweet from the honey. I don't really want it to be too sweet. It's really good. I don't eat artichokes enough. They're so creamy, they just melt in your mouth. And this is so nice because there's like little crispy bits on the outside. And I have to say this vinaigrette's really nice. <laughs> really tangy, really fresh. I would eat this whole thing for dinner. <laughs> it would be hard to share after all that time and work. Click the link in the description below for the recipe for these grilled artichokes. They're so good.